afternoon or evening, Church of the Valley. Thank you for joining us as we continue our series called Back to the Basics, where we're attempting to define and apply the foundations of the Christian faith. We began the series about a month ago with a message on the gospel of Jesus Christ, the reality that we are not saved by what we do, but whose we are. And then the second week, we taught on the word of God and how if we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and chosen by the Father and saved by the Son, we put into practice God's word, not because we have to, but because we want to. Then last week, Pastor Mike taught on confession, which pointed us back to First and foremost, that confession is all about our relationship with God. Today, we're talking about generosity. And for the first time in 173 weeks that I've been the lead pastor of this church, we're going to address money in the church in a sermon from a biblical perspective. I share that because I know that a consistent thing I hear from people regarding the church of Jesus Christ at large generally is that churches just always talk about money. But I have foregone that for 1,211 days as I have been the lead pastor of Church of the Valley, not because it isn't important, but because the gospel and understanding our identity, our self-worth through the lens of the good news of Jesus Christ has and will always be our intent and target as a church. But today, we're going to unpack how generosity is a supernatural response to understanding the gospel. Let me say that another way. We release our control of earning and rely and depend more on God as he and what he says that we are. And he says that we are his. He says that we are forgiven. And we do all of this through the lens of the gospel. And when we understand the lens of the gospel, there is this response, which is generosity. I know for a lot of us, money holds a pretty prominent place in our psyche and identity. We spend an average of 40 to 50 hours a week working to provide for our families or get ahead or just keep our heads above water to be able to support ourselves and maybe, just maybe, save some money for a rainy day or some future endeavor. Money is a tool, but society today often treats it as the point. Greed and self-preservation, luxury and pleasure become a placebo version of our goal rather than as a spirit-indwelled believer that we should communicate that our target really ought to be the glory of God being given to the God of the universe. So prosperity, preachers, and charlatans, and con artists distort the gospel message and the scriptures to bend people to give according to the preacher's will rather than the word of God. And that is evidenced by how the leadership uses the money for their selfish gain. Today, I want to cover giving, or as some of us know it as offering, or in some cases, tithing, which I can already feel some of you going, I don't want to listen to this. Because maybe you feel guilty because you don't give towards the ministry of God financially. I want to point us back to something that Mike said last week, that guilt is the wrong tool to move us to true repentance. Guilt is a wonderful tool to get someone to do something for the wrong reasons right now. But biblically, we trust that God transforms people over time, and it is not a one and done, but a progressive change in his people. So Jesus seemed to talk a lot about money in the scriptures. I'm sure verses may even come to mind as I say that, but here's the thing. Even though he spoke a ton about money, especially found in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Every time he spoke about money, finances, or monetary gain, he was speaking of matters of the heart. And where where better to find Jesus speaking of finances based on our heart posture than the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus spoke to a crowd, they were near a a mountainside, and and proclaimed the attitudes that be in his followers, also known as the Beatitudes. And spoke of not what people must attain to be justified, as if they could save themselves, but how the Holy Spirit leads us to behave if we have truly believed the gospel. Let me say that another way. What Jesus speaks of is not what we must do to be saved, but what we do because we have been saved already by Jesus. It's a subtle difference, but it's a very important one. So let's look at Jesus' words regarding money and how that and and what money can actually do for us. He says in Matthew chapter 6 verse 19, "Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal." 
Jesus is alluding to hoarding things or striving for material possessions as our target and goal. And it should not, nor needs to be, our motivation for our lives, our work, or our identity. Why? Well, because they decay, for one thing. There is nothing we own and can attain materially that doesn't end up in a yard sale or in the dump eventually. And these possessions are at risk of being stolen away from us because if they are so attractive to us who have worked for them, they're probably just as attractive to those who want to steal them. The covetousness of the heart that God calls out in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17 goes like this. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So listen, don't covet your neighbor's donkey. I'm kidding. I mean, you shouldn't. That's what he says. But he's pointing to this covetedness, which is a plague and a disease that the human heart, the natural instinct of a fallen person is to want what others have, to be jealous when others receive things that we think we deserve. We may at first show happiness for others who are succeeding, but without a moment's notice, our attitude may change to why do they get that? Why do they deserve that? And generally, they didn't do anything, but our hearts are exposed when we once again think that God's economy and his gospel are based on earning rather than on grace. This was and probably still is an issue for me. I have this disposition to think that the world revolves around me. I think I'm Truman Burbank in The Truman Show way too often. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. (laughs) And so I become enamored with what I think I deserve in comparison to others around me. Let me just say, comparison not only is sinful, it doesn't at all glorify God, nor is it logical. Because you will always find someone subjectively that is better or worse than you are. And God does not grade on a curve. He grades against Jesus. And yet Jesus lets us copy off of his paper, spiritually speaking. So don't store up treasures on earth. Don't aim for the most stuff. Don't use your earnings to glorify yourself. But what does Jesus say next in Matthew 6? In verse 20, he says, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Store up treasure in heaven. Okay, so is this a a spiritual savings account? Not exactly. Once again, Jesus isn't speaking literally of money as much as he is speaking of a heart's posture to seek first the kingdom of God with Jesus Christ at the center. But store up treasure in heaven means to have a heavenly perspective in this earthly life. I've seen how this passage gets perverted by people intending to make this most about money rather than the heart and attempt to guilt people into giving away their riches for the blessing of the church or the preacher and any and everything but God. To store up treasure doesn't mean you sell everything you have and give it to a religious entity, but it may mean that you entrust your finances, a a percentage or an amount to God's work through his people. This isn't the only application, but it is one that we tend in our flesh to argue against because we have heard the horror stories of the abuse that churches and religious organizations have used the finances of a community of believers to fund something very selfish and ungodly. But let's begin with what we know as an offering. Offering is something that we see throughout the Old Testament that was a way for those who were God-fearing individuals to give back to God. There were burnt offerings. The purpose of a burnt offering was for general atonement of sin and expression of devotion to God. The instructions for a burnt offering are given in Leviticus 1. The offering could be a bull, verse 3, sheep or goat, verse 10, dove or pigeon, verse 14. The animal was to be burnt whole overnight. Though its skin was given to the priest, the burnt offering was likely the earliest type of atonement offering in the Old Testament. Then there was the grain offering. The purpose of a grain offering was this voluntary expression of devotion to God, recognizing his goodness and his providence over his people. The instructions for the grain offerings are given in Leviticus 2. Generally, it was cooked bread or baked, verse 4, grilled, verse 5, fried, verse 7, 
roasted or made into a type of cereal, verse 14. Though always seasoned, verse 13, unsweetened and unleavened, verse 11, but unlike the burnt offering, only a portion of the offering was to be burnt. The remainder went to the priests for their meal. Then there was the peace offering. The third offering is shalem, or peace offering. This category, first discussed in Leviticus 3, included thanksgiving offerings, free will offerings. The offering could be cattle, chapter 3, verse 1 of Leviticus, sheep, verse 7, or a goat, verse 12. It could be male or female, but most, but must be without deceit or defect, I mean. It was a thanksgiving offering. It could also include a variety of breads. The purpose of the peace offering was to consecrate a meal between two or more parties before God and share that meal together in fellowship and peace and commitment to each other's future prosperity. Then there was the sin offering, the fourth offering, which was called the shatath. It literally means sin or sin offering. This offering is sometimes seen as an offering of atonement for unintentional sin, according to Leviticus chapter 4. Similarly, it's sometimes viewed as a guilt offering, removing the consequences for lack of perfection. But as an atonement offering, it contained elements of a burnt offering, yet at the same time had elements of this peace offering. Conversely, some of the the sins for which one needed atonement were not moral, but rather matters of ritual, uh, uh, ritual impurity. As such, some have proposed the term purification offering, instead of sin offering. And the primary purpose of this offering is not to atone for sins, but rather to purify oneself for re-entering the presence of God. And lastly, there was something known as the guilt offering. But unlike the English word guilt, this does not refer to a matter of one's conscience, but rather just something one owes on account of a sin that they've done. Other suggestions for this name of this offering or could be the trespass offering or the uh, reparation offering. And the purpose of this offering was to make reparations for one's sins. As such, this offering had a specific monetary value. And one who owed another on account of a debt due to sin could repay it in silver rather than by sacrificing a ram. In addition, there was a 20% fee was assessed and given to the priest who mitigated the debt. Now, what's fantastic is we now have an offering in Jesus Christ who paid all of the debt. The sacrificial system of the Old Testament was a means of grace by which the relationship between God and humanity begins to be restored. But ultimately, the sacrificial system was inadequate, and none could repay the debt of life that was owed until Christ defeated death once and for all. In the age of the church, we live in light of Christ's amazing sacrifice for us while also offering our own lives as living and holy sacrifices, according to Paul in Romans 12 and Peter in 1 Peter 2. But let me show you how the writer of Hebrews says it. He says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, they would not have stopped being offered. For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, verse 5, When Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that we will have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ for once for all. So I just spent a bunch of time kind of doing a real quick overview of offerings in the Old Testament. So why do we share about offerings? 
Because in the Old Testament and today, we can totally misunderstand why we do an offering. In the case of our treasure, specifically by giving to the church of the living God. For some, they may think that by their amount or their consistency of giving, that that secures them some type of say in what happens within the church. And if you are a consistent participant at Church of the Valley, you do have a say. But not because of what you give as if you were a shareholder, but based on your care and your faithfulness to be part of the community of Church of the Valley. Many call an offering within churches tithes and offerings. We tend to call it an offering, not because we don't agree with tithes, but because tithes was an Old Testament term which simply meant a tenth, a tenth of your income. But in the Old Testament, it didn't just mean your income. It also meant a tenth of your grain and other things that you would spare unto the Lord. 10% is a fine number, but we don't want to tell people that the percentage in which they give justifies them because it doesn't. Some people within our church community give far greater than that number, and some are still striving to eventually give 10%. This is something that is between you and the Lord. Let me say that again. This is something that's between you and the Lord. And the best thing we can do is educate you biblically on why we give in the first place. And then within your personal relationship with God and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the reading of God's word can work out what amount. Percentage and frequency, all of those things are things that you decide in your relationship with God to contribute towards the work of ministry at the church that you are a part of. And also elsewhere, if you have other people that are missionaries and people within your sphere of influence that you want to give unto because the Lord has uh, pointed you towards that. But all of this is for the glory of God's name. A very well-known verse that talks about this, which we have uh, really haven't covered before, is when Paul's speaking to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Paul's speaking to the church and he says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So as Paul speaks to the church in Corinth, he points out the heart behind giving. It is not a guilt offering, nor a reaction to an emotion. It is an act of faith out of thanksgiving of the one who has given us everything. So Jesus then says in Matthew 6, verse 21, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whoa, 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 Jesus. What do you mean where my treasure is? I got stuff I need to buy. But yet Jesus isn't saying that the needs we have are what take authority over our devotion to Christ. We need far less than we think. But the fact is that where we posture our debit card and our credit cards and our Amazon Prime account and whatever other materialistic thing that becomes the apple of our eye, these things compete with the sufficiency of God's saving grace and wonderful love for his people. So knowing that in the gospel, we find our treasure in who God says we are, our identity in Jesus Christ, that treasure, that entity of worth is what Christianity is all about. It's not about finding our worth in this world, but finding our worth in our reflection in the eyes of Jesus Christ. See, we earn nothing, but God gifts us his son. We earn nothing, but God gifts us his righteousness. We earn nothing, and yet God gifts us his spirit. We did nothing right and earn nothing, and he gifts us a new heart, and he gifts us his word. Are you kidding me? We do nothing, and God gives us everything in Jesus Christ. But what is our response? What do we do when we grasp the gospel in its beauty and entirety? Look at Jesus using a parable regarding what the kingdom of heaven is like. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through through 46, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Jesus doesn't speak of an application of what someone must do to receive the gospel. He speaks to the heart of how important the gospel, salvation, inheritance, and the kingdom of God really is. Because it's worth everything. That's why he uses these two parables to illustrate how much someone who grasps 
The gospel is willing to forsake things of this world. In verse 44, Jesus says this man, in his joy, goes and sells everything he has. This is not begrudging submission, nor is this compulsory. It is in joy. It is in his laughter. It is in his contentment. He has realized that the kingdom of heaven is worth far more than anything in this world has to offer. And when we truly embrace this, we don't look at our lifestyle or our comfort as the end all. We look past that. We look past this life, in fact, and realize that the investment we can have and do have in the gospel far out returns any investment we have in this life and in this world. We all tend to have what I would call diversified worship. Here's what I mean by that. We may be committed and holy completely in front of other people to the Lord. But what about in the secret places of our hearts? What about when no one is looking? What is it that we strive for that isn't God's will or God's glory? Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's super subtle. But this is something that we as believers need to embrace and confess and repent of as God illuminates what idols we really have. For many, it's money. Not money in and of itself, but what money provides us. We believe that money provides us safety and comfort and stability and pleasure. But when we are yearning for those things from a tool, we tend to worship the creation rather than the creator. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says to Timothy, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This verse gets misquoted all the time. It doesn't say that money is the root of all kinds of evil. It says that the love, the admiration, the striving for money is the root of all kinds of evil because it leads to greed. It leads to idol worship and attempting to fulfill what only God truly can provide, which is comfort and shelter and the providing of our needs. I don't know how you sin, but one thing I know about sin is that it may look different to other people. I think we think sin is so black and white when it's actually a matter of our hearts. Let me give you an example that best illustrates this regarding the nuance of people's sin in my life. When your bed or your refrigerator or something within your everyday lifestyle breaks down, what do you do? Well, if you're frugal, and that's the politically correct way of saying that you're cheap, which I am, you'll go on Craigslist because you figure someone else's used whatever will be a better deal than paying for something brand new. Now, if your refrigerator is broken, you'll go on Craigslist, you'll probably look for a fridge that fits your needs, doesn't seem too old, probably isn't too ugly, not that fridges are usually that attractive, and one that fits specifically within your budget. And you may take, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes doing some research, and then you may contact the seller to figure out if a deal can be made. That's normal. There's no problem in anything I just described. Now, if I go on Craigslist, at least when I was younger, and I'd say significantly more materialistic, even though I know I still struggle with this today, I'd begin looking at fridges. Then I'd move to cars. And then it wouldn't just be 15 to 20 minutes, but it would be hours upon hours of endlessly looking for deals on vehicles that I could buy and soup up and drive and then sell for a profit. Now, here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with buying and reselling, but the heart issue was that I became so enthralled, so captivated by this endeavor that it began, uh, when I began looking for a need that I then, without realizing, ran into this in entirely unhealthy idol worship time and I would do this over and over again. So for you, Craigslist is a tool. For me, it became an outlet for my materialism and diversified my worship to overtake and really overshadow my love and devotion to God because my waking hours would become more about finding the deal than they would about walking with the Lord. For some of you, that analogy might not make a ton of sense. And I'm glad for you. But for some others, that analogy may speak a little too closely to home, to how you view something else in your life. Anything from social media, maybe all the way to real estate. 
The problem is that when we make a good thing a God thing, and we forget who is ultimately deserving of our worship and our praise. Having money or being financially secure is not at all sinful or wrong, but allowing a tool to get worship or to become your target of your affection is absolutely a sin that God speaks against over and over in the scriptures. So that brings me to my last point, I think. I believe that God provides the antidote to materialism, greed, and covetedness in his example of generosity. See, you and I will never outgive God, but we can be a reflection of his character as we care for the needs of those around us and for the people in and outside of the church. First, it requires faith. It requires an active obedience to trust God when he says things like this in Matthew 13, verse 44. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, that what you will eat or drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. Do they not, uh, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you worrying at a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things. Nailed it. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So there is faith which is salvation put into practice in order to trust God with your finances. A while back, there was a couple who came to me. They were moving out of the area in which they lived in Southern California and had begun watching our playlist. And the husband came to me and told me a story about how he and his bride, through prayer, had felt that they were supposed to give back whatever they received in a tax refund to the Lord. They didn't realize a few things when they made this commitment. First, they didn't realize that the tax refund was going to be significantly higher than they had imagined. And two, they also didn't realize that he was going to lose his job where he had been working for a while before they got this tax refund. So he calls me to ask me if it would be okay if he donated this fairly large gift to the church as they were still praying about becoming part of the community. Now, when he told me the story, I, I got to be honest, I was thinking probably like a lot of you were thinking, um, keep your money, bro. You don't have a job. How will you make ends meet in the in-between time? But as I talked with him, I could tell that this was a personal conviction that wasn't one that necessarily was going to be a natural response to losing his job, but a supernatural response to trusting their God. So he gave the gift to the church. And if I'm honest, it helped us as a church. It kept our staff being paid like normal, even through these past seven months where nothing has been normal and giving has been a little bit down. And guess what? We talked about a week after he had given this gift. And you know what the Lord did? You know what happened? God provided for their needs. He got a new job in this field that he had been studying in this area that pays more than he was making before and is perfect for his family. Now, I asked permission to share that story even though I didn't tell you who they were. And I don't want you to hear that story and think, well, I just need to give large sums of money to the church and then God is obligated to give me favor, fortune, and my heart's desires. But I I tell you that story to remind us that faith looks unnatural, especially to a world that is after riches and wealth but our faith practiced in giving towards the kingdom of God is not something that the Lord ignores or forgets to use for our sanctification. And one final point, generosity is a supernatural response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
If we really believe the gospel, how could we not want to go out of our way to help others be made whole? Today, we've talked a lot about money and the realization that our giving of treasure is a symptom of our belief in the gospel and faith in our creator and provider. But you know, it's not just treasure. It can also be our time and our talents that we may be called to give. If we believe the gospel, being generous with our time and our talents and our treasure are not something that should be as surprising as they are to people within the church. Why? Because we believe the gospel that God gave and we received, not because we earned it, but because God is so good and gracious that he would do for us what we were unable to do for ourselves. Our generosity is not at all because we want glory for ourselves or credit or kudos or likes. We as believers in Jesus Christ are generous with our time and our talents and our treasure because each of them are gifts from God that we just give a portion back to outwardly express what we believe truly inwardly. Back in the middle of the summer, uh, my wife and I had found out that God had provided us with our fifth pregnancy. But due to a lot of complications, it was and still is somewhat of a high-risk pregnancy that we have had to go and have a lot of procedures and checkups to monitor how this baby is doing. But so far, so good by God's grace. But I'll say this, we were shocked to find this out as we believed we had made the proper precautions to not have become pregnant. So our heads were spinning in this moment and realizing that everything we had planned for our future life was not at all what God had planned for us. Well, the very next day after we found out that we are with child, uh, a, a family that has long appreciated my ministry known as Compelled FaceTimed with me to let me know that they had been praying and wanting to partner in a home with the Rileys so that we could continue to do ministry in Santa Clara where we believe God has called us. Now, timing isn't always obvious, but sometimes it is. And as this couple made this point to say that since February, they have been thinking and praying through this idea, honestly, this was hilarious to me, but also awe-inspiring. As I remember in February, before the pandemic even started, getting on my knees and praying to God and asking him that somehow, some supernatural way that he would provide a home for our family that we wouldn't have to continue to move and we could lay down roots as we've moved nine times in our 17 years of marriage. So as this family began to describe to me how the situation would take place if we decided to receive their offer, it was obvious that even though much of what they were doing was a good business idea, it was and it was, very, uh, it was uh, written up very fairly, they have gone above and beyond just a financial partnership that would hopefully incur some equity in a home, but they've done more than enough to help the Rileys secure their forever home in Santa Clara. Now, I want to make known that even though they essentially went halvesies on a house with us, and that that is unbelievably generous And just because I'm a pastor of a church who struggles teaching and talking about money because I've seen it used for selfish ambition so much, I think when some people hear that we were blessed with this gift through this family, that they somehow think that we deserve this. Listen, just because I serve Jesus in a pastoral role, I don't deserve this gift at all. In fact, I'm a sinner who has been saved by grace, who truly deserves death, but God in his generosity, gives me life in Jesus Christ. So on top of this generous gift with this purchase of this home through this family, they also made a point to help us remodel the home so that we could be in a place that really felt like this house was truly a home and it was ours and not like the nine different rentals that we went to and from. Now listen, this family not only provided money that most of us will never see in a bank account ever, and I don't know if I could uh, calculate that amount of money, but they also did this at a time in a way that was a disadvantage to them. As I know, there were tons of ways that they could have used their money to enjoy this life and their life in a more personal way and and enjoy where they live and do all of these things for themselves. But like the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus didn't use his advantage for his own personal gain, but used it so that you and I could be made whole 
He didn't care about his comfort or what he would gain. He cared about obeying his father perfectly out of love-inspired obedience. And he took off his royal robe and he came and he dwelled among us and he lived the life we couldn't and he died the death we should have died and he physically rose from the dead. As Paul points out to the church in Philippians in chapter 2, in verse 6, he says, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, <clears throat> therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that gift of generosity and that grace is why people will give up financial safety to make it so others can be made whole. That is why people will give up time and talents to love other people and point them to Jesus. We don't give because we have to in order to be justified. We give generously and cheerfully because God first gave us his son. And giving is not a guilty response to the needs of people. Giving is all about wherever your treasure is, so is your heart. And God in his generosity and grace gave us not only a way out of hell, but a way into the kingdom of heaven. And it's all because his son is the way, the truth, and the life. So I want to take a breath. That's my sermon. We're going to do the offering I don't feel like I have to describe offering very much because I just preached on it for a good amount of time, way more than I've ever talked about it as I've been the pastor at this church. But I want to tell you that this is an act of worship. This is what people who trust Jesus Christ and are a part of Church of the Valley do, not because they have to, but because it is the supernatural response of understanding the gospel. And so I want to read the verse that I read before in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Paul says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So my hope is, as we've studied this today, as we've talked about generosity, as we've talked about giving, that you wouldn't feel that you were pulled into having to give because you somehow watched this entire sermon. I'm not going to have Erin come up here with her guitar and play to get everybody to then come and give because you're not allowed in the building currently anyway. But you can give online. You can, you can use uh, the website and you can go to covalley.com forward slash give or giving and you can do it via PayPal that way or there's also another way to do it out of your bank account or you can simply mail a check. But it's just the opportunity that we have as worshipers of Jesus Christ to give back a portion that we've decided in our own hearts with our relationship with God to do. And so I hope that you've heard this message and even this encouragement of giving as an opportunity for you to see the reality that God's at work through the generosity of his people. Let's pray. Father, that uh, it's been a long time coming, and I don't talk a lot about money, and I know, and you know, Lord, how money has been an idol in my life, in my past, and, uh, and God, there's no there's no surety that it won't be in the future. And so, God, I cling to your gospel, and I cling to the economy that you have of faithfulness, that you work through your people and you give us faith to trust you. And so, Lord, I pray that those who decide to give, not under compulsion, but out of love and admiration for their God, that they would give cheerfully, and that, Lord, you would take that giving and you would make much of Jesus Christ through it, Lord. Would you make disciples of all nations and generations? Would you protect your people, and would you continue to give us the opportunity to proclaim your gospel to those that are in need while allowing us to be generous with the things that you've given us. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.